Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Israeli News Live special show with Sophia Smallstorm again. Hello, Sophia. Welcome to our studio. I love coming to your studio. Yes. Now, Sophia, we already had you twice. We talked about 5G. We talked about glyphosate, effects of glyphosate on humans, on horses. And uh, that was a very successful show. You always have something very special to tell us. And today we are going to speak about electricity. Now, Sophia has a, a newsletter. Every month, Sophia, is it that you give out a newsletter? Every month? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's scheduled for every month. But sometimes I have to do a double issue because there's so much to say that uh, my issues are usually six pages, single spaced, but sometimes I have to do 12 pages. Like this last issue is a double issue and it, it required 12 pages. So I can do a couple of 12 pages a year, but basically you get six pages a month and it goes by snail mail and subscription. Yes. Can you tell uh, listeners a little bit more about where they can find you as far as uh, your website and how they can sign up for your newsletter? Yeah, the best way to find me is to type in Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, not P-H, S-O-F-I-A, smallstorm.com. That takes you to a blog page on a larger website, which is pretty static, my About the Sky website. It was a website about geoengineering and chemtrails, and I've left it alone because a lot of people like it. They like the basic and certain kinds of detailed information on it. But I also have a newsletter page. You can read some samples from previous years. But the real, the best way to stay with me on what I'm dabbling in, and it's really dabbling. You know, nobody pays us for this. We just go kind of where we want to, where the curiosity drives us and I like to dive pretty deep and so my newsletter was a way for me to actually collate and write down my uh, journeys into different rabbit holes and it has become something that people have really um, taken to I'm happy to say I've been doing it since 2010 and this is now 2019 so we're going on 10 years practically and you have to subscribe. Um, it's a minimum donation of $50 a year, a little more for overseas. It goes out by snail mail. And there are a lot of people who stayed with me since 2010. They've never, never dropped the subscription. And they're keeping these newsletters in binders. What began a few years ago was that radio hosts who I put on my newsletter list as a gift because they interviewed me frequently, they started to say, let's just talk about your newsletters. So that's a way for me to get the content out to a wider audience if they don't want to read it. But generally, I like to have the subscribers know everything first. This newsletter is not posted online, and it is not a newsletter. It's not news, okay? It's, it's me writing a personal kind of like a diary of where I'm going and what I'm seeing and connecting dots. Is that how it strikes you, Yana? Yes, you definitely research to depth so, uh, several subjects, uh, always different subject to a great depth, and then you write your own opinion uh, about the subject that uh, you have researched, you know. And it is a most wonderful newsletter to read, the last one uh, on our show about glyphosate in horses I used in my homeschool with my daughter Ariella. She enjoyed it. Now, I do have to tell you that this electricity one would be hard for her to understand. She's only 10 years old, but it was very interesting to read, and uh, it will be very exciting to bring it over here to our show so listeners can learn about this as well, Sophia. Now, but for those who don't know Sophia yet, she is an independent researcher, and I call her independent journalist as well, because she has connected several dots, so this title of independent journalist is very, very well deserved. Uh, what do you think, Sophia? Am I right? Well, that's very nice of you. It's an honor to be called an, an independent journalist, and I've connected thousands of dots, Yana, not just several. 
thousands. Okay, well, I don't know you that long, Sophia. So <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it was very nice to find you and meet you and get to know you. So I'm so happy you're here with me right now. But anyway, let's get to the subject and your newsletter about electricity. Now, Sophia, electricity is something so normal, right, that we cannot live without. So tell me, what did you find out? Why did you go researching about electricity? Well, two things happened. This was my March newsletter. And one thing that happened in March was California had an absolute avalanche, a bombardment of butterflies for several days. And I was driving uh, to go swimming at the pool, and I saw all these butterflies. They were flittering and just going right across the road. I mean, they were crossing your windshield, and there were millions of them. And I thought, what's this? And it continued and continued, and when I got to the pool, we were swimming with butterflies flying right across our line of sight. They were flying across the water. Wow. And first I thought they were the monarch because they were orange and black. But one thing I noticed about them was that they had, they were very fat. First I thought maybe they're moths, mm -hmm. orange and black moths. But uh, it was clear that they were butterflies, not moths. And I Googled and actually heard on the news that it was the painted ladies. The painted lady butterfly is Vanessa Cardui. That's the Latin name. And they are the toughest butterfly species on Earth. And they were migrating from the deserts of Southern California, where they apparently go every year to wait for the rains. They were migrating up to as far as Alaska. Wow. And they did this for days. And everybody in Southern California and Central and Northern was seeing these butterflies and it was quite fascinating and here's what really got me when I started researching them first of all the reason that they're fat and they look like moths is because they have this energy pack this um, goop it's literally fat that they carry in their uh, torso and that is the fat that fuels them on the journey to the Pacific Northwest and they only live two weeks, Yana, and they go at 25 miles an hour, which means from San Diego to L.A. is um, two hours if you travel at 50 miles an hour or 55. So that means it would take them four hours to reach L.A. and then hundreds of miles to go to Oregon and Washington and into Canada. And I'm thinking, what's the point? They're not even going to live for the whole journey, right? Right. So I, yeah, so I researched more and more. They only live a couple of weeks. And I found out that when, when species, especially butterflies, have a population explosion, they will migrate. So what happened this winter was we had a profusion of rain in Southern California, and the rain was over the desert as well, and there were these enormous explosions of desert bloom, flowers, blossoms. And this created all kinds of food for butterflies. So the butterflies that were hiding out in the desert waiting for the rain had a profusion of food. By the way, all this is material for your homeschooling, if you like. <laughs> That's true. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> and so the butterflies proliferated themselves. They had so much food that their population exploded. And then, now think about the logic. They're not going to all stay in the same place because then they're going to compete for food. So when they have a population explosion, they will migrate. And they move. They move to other places where there's going to be possibly more food supply. So even if they don't live for the entire migration to the Pacific Northwest, or Canada, or Alaska, they are serving their species. They're all moving, even if they only last two weeks, and they'll land and eat and breed, and then more of them will be born, and then they'll go and fly farther, and this is how they get to the northern reaches, hmm. by serving the species. 
Each butterfly works for the entire species, even though it only lives for a couple of weeks. Amazing, amazing facts. Very nice. So how did you, is that connected somehow to, to the electricity subject? Yes, because, you know, the painted lady is the toughest and most successful butterfly in the world. And one thing that makes it so tough is it's able to feed on a wide range of plants. For instance, you know about the monarch butterfly, right? That's similar looking, but actually prettier and more sleek. Hmm. And the monarch only feeds on milkweed. That's dandelions. And the reason the monarch is expiring, can you guess, is because of Roundup, the weed killer. Wow. Wow, I believe it. Yes. They're killing dandelions, and you know they're also very good herb, healing herb for a lot of diseases. Yeah. Sure, and I've learned since that a lot of these herbs that are also having an explosion, like one of them is called knotweed, Japanese knotweed. It helps tremendous numbers of ailments. Um, it's proliferating. This is a complete sidetrack, and forgive me, but. No, and we're told, okay. you've got to get rid of these weeds. You have to get rid of these weeds. But the weeds are proliferating because they serve the healing of ailments that are proliferating in us. That's so anyway, okay. that was a segue. That's okay. So I watched these butterflies and I thought, all right, these are the toughest butterflies. They are the ones that are not dying off. They're having a population explosion. And I wanted to just let you know, where is it? Oh, yeah. So... The monarch, for instance, which is the one that we usually hear of, that's orange and black, has had a 99.4 diminution in numbers compared to 40 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, very sad, isn't it? 99.4%. Yeah, but this one, the painted lady, is going strong. And so then I was thinking, as I was watching them, I mean, they're just fluttering away, fluttering, and they're all heading north. And some surfers told me they were even flying over the ocean. They didn't need to land anywhere. They were taking shortcuts where, you know, the land, the shore, um, it kind of snakes in and out. Well, the butterflies were just going straight north, and they were over the actual ocean. Um, so anyway, I was fascinated by them. And I was wondering, well, what do they do about EMFs? Do they notice EMFs? So I started to Google this, and I found out that definitely butterflies are electromagnetically sensitive. They have antennas. They, they use electromagnetism to navigate. And there was this um, report on a website called emfsafetynetwork.org. In 2013, the City Council of Pacific Grove, which is Monterey County in California, voted to put permanent 4G cell antennas right next to a monarch butterfly sanctuary. They voted against the butterflies. And Pacific Grove is an area where the monarch spends part of the winter. And that is very, very sad indeed that they would vote against the butterflies where everybody knew. I mean, this was a tourist attraction, the Monarch Sanctuary in Pacific Grove, and they put these 4G AT&T antennas right there and right next to one of the habitats that the poor monarch was relying on for its long trip from Canada. Um, but anyway, so I decided... I would start reading this new book that I got by Arthur Furstenberg called The Invisible Rainbow. He actually wrote it in 2017, and I had heard about it, but it was only recently that I ordered it, and I started to read. And oh my gosh, it blew me away, Yana. Totally blew me away. Hmm. Tell us more about it, Sophia. Tell us about the book. What's in it? First of all, Arthur Furstenberg is an extremely in-depth researcher. He has gone through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies and reports, and he has a really amazing way of collating and stringing together information. The guy is a genius, 
And he did go to medical school at UCLA, intending to be a doctor. I don't think he made it to medical practice because I think he suffered from some kind of radiation illness in his early 20s, and that pretty much sidelined him. And then he had to devote his whole life to recovery. So he started researching electricity, which is kind of a twin of radiation, all right? Mm -hmm. And he is also, I have to say, an absolutely amazing writer. Each sentence is beautiful. <laughs> That's good. Just like yours, Sophia. I wish I was a writer like you. I wish I had that talent. I have to suffer, really, when I write because, um, you know, English is my fifth language. And it's so difficult. But every time I read your newsletters, it seems just you have such an easy time writing, right? Well, I love to write, but I have to say Arthur is possibly more ornate and more brilliant than I am. My newsletters tend to be chatty. I could, yeah, I could, I guess, put myself to the task of writing brilliantly, but these newsletters are not exactly that. Um, well, you're but using anyway, a lot of detail in them, which helps the reader to understand more. You know, using a beautiful details around things, and that, that's just better for understanding. Right, and I try to be thorough, and I try to lay out the information so that it's sequential and logical, and people follow it. And so Arthur's book, even in the first chapter of The Invisible Rainbow, he talks about this thing that I never heard of, and nobody that I've talked to ever heard of it. It's called the Leyden Experiment. Sometimes it's called the Leyden Jar. So there was a town, I believe it was in the Netherlands, called Leyden, L-E-Y-D-E-N. And now this was the year 1746. And I'll quote from his chapter one. The experiment of Leyden was a craze that was immense, universal. Everywhere you went, people would ask you if you had experienced its effects. The year was 1746. And now, to clarify, the Leyden jar was this physics professor's effort to catch and store electricity in a bottle. Okay, today when we store electricity, we use um, these uh, technical creations called capacitors or condensers. But back then, people were rubbing a glass flask that they filled with water, and they put a nail in the cork. Now, this is a very simplified explanation. And then as you rub the outside of the glass, you get this static charge, and then if you touch the nail, the static is on the surface, and if you touch the nail, you get a shock. And the early experimenters with the Leyden flask, they were thrown across the room. And they were scientists of various sorts, physicists, and they were stunned at the voltage that was produced. And they wrote and warned, quote, electricity is not to be inflicted on the living. Hmm. But when you tell people not to do something, Yana, what happens? They do it anyway. <laughs> right, and it becomes a craze, right? That's right. So I'm just going to quote from the book. The general public did not react as planned. Eager men and women by the thousands all over Europe lined up to give themselves the pleasure of electricity. Abbe Jean-Antoine Nollet a theologian turned physicist, introduced the magic of the Leyden jar into France. He tried to satisfy the insatiable demands of the public by electrifying tens, hundreds of people at once, having them take each other by the hand so as to form a human chain. He would place himself at one of the ends of the chain while the person who represented the last link took hold of the bottle. Suddenly, the abbot would touch with his hand the metal wire inserted in the flask, he would complete the circuit, and immediately the shock would be felt simultaneously by the whole line of people. Electricity had become a social affair. The world was possessed by electromania. Are you there, Sophia? 
Yes, I'm okay. pausing so you can make sounds of astonishment. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, that is very amazing that, uh, you know, like you said, that they were w warning people against it, yet it went, you know, people just went crazy over it and wanted it. And here we go. We have it now. Right. And now, now we have like more problems to worry about, as you say, you know, the Wi-Fi towers and everything else. So nobody even pays attention to electricity, Sophia. Like, you know, nobody thinks of it as something dangerous. So this is, it's good that you're bringing it out so I can hear more. Go ahead. I, I'm really interested in where it will come to. So to continue his, the quote, the experience... <laughs> of being shocked became so popular that the public began to complain of not being able to give themselves the pleasure of an electric shock without having to wait in line. A demand was created for a portable apparatus that everyone could purchase for a reasonable price and enjoy. Wealthy ladies hosted such entertainment in their homes. They hired instrument makers to craft large, ornate electrical machines that they displayed like pianos. People of moderate means bought off-the-shelf models that were available in an assortment of sizes, styles, and prices. Hmm. Amazing. So today, just as you said, Yana, we have electromania. Nobody wants to be without electricity. And yet nobody really understands what the biological cost is. Even I, who knew something about electricity, and I am learning and being trained in electrical remediation of homes, purging them of dirty electricity. If people want to know how to do that, there are different ways to do it. They can contact me through my website, sophiasmallstorm.com. And I can give them information, and there are things they can buy. And I've worked out a whole strategy of starting from inexpensive and getting more expensive as you may need to. So I'm happy to do this for people. Um, I've been studying this for several years, and now I have the various products at hand that you can use to remediate your environment but anyway that's a sidetrack well when so, you talk about dirty electricity so people understand a little bit more because not everybody understands what it is but i think isn't it like solar power like you know the solar uh can you explain more about this sophia the dirty i know it's a sidetrack we'll come back but since you mentioned it yes Okay. So you have coming into your house 240 volts from the power, uh, power station, the, your utility company. And it goes into your electrical box, your panel, your breaker box. And that is separated into two legs. They're phases, phase A and phase B, basically two sides of your house. So the 240 is broken into 120 and 120. And basically, you don't always get 240. Sometimes you might get 208, 210. Um, you might get higher than 240. But you're getting approximately 110 divided. That's 240 divided. 220, 240 divided is 110. So that's how you get your 110 on each side of your house. And then you have smaller circuits that go off those two phases or legs. Now, in the old days, we really didn't have a lot of demand. We didn't have a lot of load. We might have, you know, some something electrical, some lights. We had a refrigerator. We might have a washing machine or a dryer or something like that. But today we have all kinds of devices plugged into our circuits in all different rooms. And every time you add a device that consumes power, you create a recoil effect on the lines. You create surges. You create a kickback you create what's called harmonics or noise. And that's referred to as dirty electricity. So now you have all of these micro surges and that is not good for your health. You want to keep your circuits as clean as possible. You don't want every device that you add adding more load to the line. And that's what it actually does. So today with the enormous amount of electronics that we use, several TVs in every house, we've got computers, we've got all kinds of stuff, Wi-Fi routers. You know, the router 
Wi-Fi used to be two amps, and now it's drawing five amps. So it's not only costing you more, it is actually draining, using more power that you're constantly paying for. So um, the smart meter puts kickback or noise on your line, and you end up with really a dirty series of circuits, and this is harmful to your health. It's bad for your appliances. It's bad for your electronics. It causes the lifespan of all these things to become a lot shorter. And it's bad for your body because you are electrical too. So there are ways to remediate dirty electricity. And one way is these little plug-in filters made by a couple of companies. But I have to warn people, I've been studying this and been training in it for over um, almost a year now. And I have to say that you should not be using tens or dozens or many of these little plug-in um dirty electricity filters, the small ones that you can hold in your hand, because after you add four of them to a house, they start to load your line. They themselves load the line. So you don't want to use more than three or four of those. And there are other ways, other kinds of equipment to bring those surges down. They're almost like whole home filters, whole home surge suppressors. And this is the kind of thing I'm getting into now. I did my own house, and I have to say, you can feel it. It's like a Zen temple. Before I had that thing attached to my breaker box and after. So this is the kind of thing I'm happy to help people with. Um, and I do. I call it EMF plus consulting. Excellent. So, Thank you, any- Sophia. Thanks for this explanation. Very important. Now let's go back to what we were talking about so we stay on track here. Right. So Arthur's book, you know, he makes it clear that electrical phenomena are not well understood. And he says, how does our brain work? How do our nerves function? How do our cells communicate? How is our body's growth choreographed? We are still fundamentally ignorant. And the question raised in this book, what is the effect of electricity on life? And this is a question Arthur points out that modern science does not even bother to ask. Hmm. Right. Keep going, Sophia. I'm learning as you as you're speaking. I'm just making notes, learning. Yeah, that's great. So he asks this question. He says, he points out, science is only concern. The only concern that scientists have is they don't want to cook your cells. This is called thermal radiation or ionizing radiation. So x-rays, nuclear radiation, in the very high end of the electromagnetic spectrum, that is so, it oscillates so quickly that it actually burns or heats biological tissue. And that has been known to be dangerous. And they think that non-lethal electricity, because that kind of frequency is lethal frequent often you know people Hiroshima Nagasaki all of this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. nuclear radiation it'll it can kill you but non-lethal electricity mainstream science doesn't even care about that Mm -hmm. and it just is it just keeps you sick I, I guess it keeps you alive but keeps you sick non lethal electricity is below the threshold of heating tissue all at once. But over time, it has effects that are cumulative and very, very harmful. So we live, remember, we live our lives with this electricity. So just let's keep that in the back of our mind and the comment that you made as well. But let's save it. So what was the first thing that brought electricity to civilization. It was the telegraph. And Furstenberg calls this an industrious spider. By 1885, the telegraph had connected almost 30,000 homes and businesses in New York City. And I want you to look up. He has pictures of this in his book, and you would be amazed. You think cell towers are ugly? The people in New York City in the 1880s, when they looked out their windows, the avenues were crisscrossed with telegraph wires. It was like this black net. 
Wow. Right? Well, I, I, I will look it up. Let's look it up because uh, I never seen it. All right. Well, that's the picture of New York City. That's one picture. So just so you know, let me get back to Skype. Um, by, by the late 1800s, more than 2,000 miles of cable were crisscrossing London. Wow. 22,000 miles throughout America, 4,000 miles in India. And then you had this transoceanic connection, 700,000 miles of copper all over the earth. Wow. So they were really into it, right? Right. And so what happened with all this copper wire everywhere? People got this condition, this illness. And it was called neurasthenia, N-E-U-R-A-S-T-H-E-N-I-A, -E neurasthenia. And it was defined pretty much in a vague general way as having weak nerves. And the first doctor who noticed it in 1869 was George Beard, and he concluded that it was caused by stress. And it seemed to just come out of nowhere. It hit people randomly. Nobody seemed to be dying from it. But other physicians were reporting it as well. They called it nervous asthenia or neurasthenia. And the symptoms were pretty much, you know, lassitude, torpor, heaviness, physical aches, mental depression. There was this electrotherapist at the time, Dr. Margaret Cleese. She was working with the insane and she opened her own electrotherapy clinic in New York, and she had a catastrophic breakdown just a few months later. She said, this is a quote from her writings, I knew neither peace nor comfort, night nor day. There remained all the usual pain of nerve trunks or peripheral nerve endings, the exquisite sensitiveness of the body, the inability to bear a touch heavier than the brush of a butterfly's wing, the insomnia, lack of strength, the recurrence of depression of spirits, the inability to use my brain at my study and writing as I wished. Wow, she, back then already, they suffered all this from electricity. Sophia, what, what can we do today? I mean... The most prescribed pills are Prozac and Ambien, right? For depression and for insomnia. And look at back right. then already, just with electricity. Yeah, Yana, they called it telegraphic sickness. It included heart palpitations, dizziness, weakened eyesight, exhaustion, memory loss. So the telegraph workers in the early 1900s were talking about this. And one telegraph worker said... Our nerves are shattered, and the feeling of health has given way to a morbid weakness, a mental depression, a leaden exhaustion. Hanging always between sickness and health, we are no longer whole. And he said, has the release of electrical power from its slumber created a danger for the health of the human race? Wow, already back then. So here we are, Sophia. <laughs> Right. And now, <laughs> telephone operators were getting sick. Right. Railway passengers, railway staffers, conductors, the guys who drove the trains, they were complaining of all kinds of unpleasant conditions, and sometimes they ended up in paralysis. So now, this is very interesting. By 1862, every rail line, Furstenberg says, was sandwiched between one or more telegraph wires running overhead, and return currents from those telegraph lines were running beneath, a portion of which flowed along the metal rails themselves, upon which the passenger cars rode. So the passengers were getting sick from just riding the trains. Wow. So now what's very interesting is this. Let's do a drum roll. We're at 1894. We have a psychiatrist in Vienna, and he is aware of neurasthenia. And he's, remember, psychiatrists are medical doctors. So he is searching for a cause for this neurasthenia, and he finds none. So he calls it a mental illness. <laughs> and that decision of this particular doctor 
transform the world. His name was Sigmund Freud. Yeah. Well known. So Arthur Furstenberg writes, because of him, because of Sigmund Freud, neurasthenia, which is still the most common illness of our day, is accepted as a normal element of the human condition for which no external cause need be sought. That means they don't even look for anything else. You have mental illness, you have mental illness. They don't need to see, figure out why. Because of Freud, environmental illness, that is, illness caused by a toxic environment is widely thought not to exist. Its symptoms are blamed on disordered thoughts and out of control emotions. Because of Freud, we are today putting millions of people on Xanax, Prozac, Zoloft, instead of cleaning up their environment. Sigmund Freud renamed neurasthenia anxiety neurosis, and its crises he called anxiety attacks. But the fact is, the symptoms of anxiety, anxiety neurosis, exactly match those of electrical illness. That's amazing, Sophia. I know I, I actually know many people who uh, have so-called panic attacks or an anxiety attacks. And that's just amazing history to connect electricity to that mysterious illness that medical establishment has no answers for. Exactly. And... This is why this book is such an amazing book. I thought I knew a bunch of stuff about electricity, but I didn't know any of this. Right. So right. the symptoms of anxiety are exactly the same as electrical illness. And, you know, it makes sense because nerves are damaged by toxins and they can also be thrown out of whack by unnatural electrical loads. Hmm. Because nerves... I mean, everything in the body basically operates on electricity. And nerves are, they are conduits for electrical impulses, right? Right. We are electrical beings, you know. That's right. Our heart so, is electrical heart. I mean, of course that it messed with our, our bodies, you know. The next thing, the next huge revelation I got from this book was... The Spanish flu. So we've heard about this epidemic in the 1900s that was called the Spanish flu. But guess what? It didn't come from Spain. What was happening at the time was the world was fighting this big war, the First World War, and radio communication was being born. Long-range radio transmitters that kept the big powers, you know, the global powers in touch with their colonies and their right. navies were going up everywhere. They were able to message across the ocean. So between April 1917 and early 1918, the Navy, U.S. Navy, had built and was operating the world's largest radio network. And these were powerful. You have 200 kilowatt arcs, 500 kilowatt arcs, alternators of high speed, and then the ability to transmit the human voice. So this um, alternator that they built in New Brunswick, New Jersey, it was turned on full time in September 1918, and it could be heard over a large part of the earth. So guess what happens? We get this thing called the Spanish flu. It struck in the same time frame as these radio huge alternators and transmitters were going up and it was even fatal well you talked in the newsletter that it didn't touch children and elderly but mysteriously the people between 18 and 40 years of age were getting this disease that's right and a lot of them were working in this radio field Spanish flu actually was not contagious, and it seemed to move with the Navy ships, which were all radio-equipped, right? Right. It came to army camps that were training in wireless. So basically, what you say, or this, is this in a, that's in a book you're describing, right? So That's in his book. Right. It, so it's the, a huge section devoted to the Spanish flu. 
The Spanish flu symptoms were not respiratory. They were the exact same as electrical illness. But even worse, nosebleeds, hemorrhage. Uh -huh. So basically, electricity has very negative effects on our immune system. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what you learn from reading this book is that everywhere radar went, radar, you know, communications, radar, mm -hmm. military radar, illness followed. Well, that's amazing discovery. Wow. Yeah, and so with the general electrification that we had, with the telegraph and all of that, we also got rampant insomnia in the late 1800s. People were unable to sleep, and that's what's happening today with everybody having routers in their house. And the more dirty electricity you have, the closer you sleep to outlets that are, are you know, putting out these enormous quantities of dirty electricity, you know, you're going to have insomnia. Yeah, so, even even my kids have insomnia. Unfortunately, my son, 15, he cannot sleep, you know. Uh, he's been asking me for melatonin lately a lot. He says, Mom, I just can't sleep. And I was thinking it's the Wi-Fi and, you know, 4G, and now that they're going to put the 5G around our neighborhood. So I'm afraid of that. But it would never enter my mind that actual electricity already can be a cause of that. Right, and Yana, it didn't used to be so bad because we didn't have a lot of devices, but now we have many more devices loading our lines. No kidding. Many more, and that causes what I call this recoil effect. It puts harmonics, it puts noise, it puts microsurge on your lines. It adds to the millivolt load on your lines, and that's coming out of all your outlets. Hmm. So, um, yeah, the the demand for sleeping pills and drugs that kicked off well i bet you pharma pills. companies love this sure they do yeah <laughs> and so they found also they were doing experiments with a faraday cage and they found that if they manipulated frequencies if they allowed certain frequencies in they could and they had a hamster in the cage, they could send this hamster in and out of hibernation. So in the 1960s, most people have heard of the Max Planck Institute. This is like a super physics institute. They did a, an experiment on people, and they shielded them from light, sound, and electromagnetic fields. And now the subjects, as long as the Earth's natural frequency was present, the subjects would have sleep and wake cycles that were like 24 hours. But when they were in a pure Faraday cage, they lost synchronization with this 24-hour cycle. They, their body temperature changed, their mental processes, and mineral excretions also kind of got all glitched up. And when, they, when the scientists brought in an artificial 10 hertz signal, so let me explain. The natural electromagnetic frequencies range from zero to 40 hertz, but they mainly go from 7 to 12. So 10 hertz is right in between. Our bodies like the harmonics, the oscillations of 7 to 12 hertz cycles per second. So when you picture a wave, an electromagnetic wave, do you know what a slinky is? No. A slinky is a toy, and it's like a spring. Imagine a spring, a metal coiled spring. Um, when you stretch that out, that's an electromagnetic wave. That's what it looks like. It's actually three-dimensional. It's oscillating along three dimensions, and it's like a drill. So the faster it oscillates, the more you get this brrr. So the slower it oscillates, it's just gentle. But the more, the more peaks it has, the more it spins and spins and spins, in each second, the, the worse the effect is on the body because all frequencies on biological tissues are registered as a mechanical force. So when you have a seven cycle wave, it's very gentle. What is Wi-Fi? 2.4 billion cycles per second, Yana. Your body only likes seven to 12. <laughs> wow, Sophia, you know. 
all this bad news. Do you have any good news for us? How do we fix this? <laughs> okay, distance is your best friend. Get away from it. Right. Turn your router off, take your cordless phones and throw them out and um, get landlines and don't keep your cell phone as an alarm clock. This is how you get away from it. Right. Just, you know, our bodies are biological machines that were not created for this. We are not compatible biologically with these frequencies, with electricity, with Wi-Fi. We are not compatible. So uh, here we go, almost in a fourth industrial revolution here. And each industrial revolution brought us more and more disease, which, you know, most diseases uh, are not really mysterious anymore, Sophia. You have connected the dots. They're man-made. We are doing it to ourselves by all of these uh, technological progress, right? So we need solutions. We need solutions of what to do. So keep going. Sophia, tell us more. What can we do? Jana, I'm going to try an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work. It doesn't always work, but I want to see if it does. So we'll just edit this out if it doesn't work, okay? Okay. Do you hear that? A little bit. Yes. Do you have any idea what that is? Somebody talking. No, I don't hear nothing. Right, I turn it off. Okay, that is the wiring in my house acting as an antenna for AM radio. I do not have a radio in here. I simply plugged in a meter with an audio um, uh, audio capability, and the AM radio is playing through the wires in my house. Wow, you got voices in your house. I'll all play the, it again. <laughs> all these frequencies, <laughs> Sophia, and yeah. that's okay, here's what here's what I did for it. That's unreal. And that affects our bodies. Okay, do you hear it now? Yes. No, do you hear it now? No. But I, I plugged in a filter. No, I'm taking the filter out. Oh, wow. Now I hear it. I just put the filter in. Now I don't hear it. Now it's there. Yeah, that's what happens. Your house, everything, your body is an antenna picking this stuff up. That you know? is unreal. That's right. And all of these affects us. On a cellular level, in, in your in your um, newsletter, you were talking about mitochondria and how it affects um, mitochondria. Okay, so we have this. We consume oxygen to make cellular energy, which is called adenosine triphosphate. Actually, the more advanced way to look at ATP, that's the fuel molecule of the cell. The the job of the mitochondria is to keep the cytoplasm charged electrically in the right way for the cell to do its work. The, everything, what is called life, involves the uptake of electrons by the cell. They use electrons to do their various jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And the electrons come from these nano batteries in the cell. Your cells can have many, many ATP batteries in them all the time. They're always firing. So you actually produce every day your body weight in ATP. You could not live for 15 seconds if your ATP was shut down in your body. Hmm. 
So ATP is the energy mechanism of the cell, but it is a battery, a nano battery that provides electrons to the cell. And where do those electrons come from? They come from several places. Ideally, they come from light, photonic transfer of electrons. That's why you need sunlight and daylight. You cannot live your life indoors like a little mole. Right. You, it comes from the earth. You need to be outside. You need to be running, flying barefoot across the Serengeti, flinging spears, catching rabbits or whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> That's what we were created for, you know, that to, to live in the nature, actually. And uh, the, the one that you notice running barefoot, that's called grounding, very important. Right, you know. because the Earth's surface, it's mainly water and it's mainly minerals, silica, the soil, rock. It carries this very mild electric current. It's very, very mild. It's an electron flow. And where does it come from? It comes from lightning striking the earth. Lightning hits the earth 200 times a second everywhere, all different places. And that creates a slight amount of voltage on the surface of the earth. So the higher you go off the earth, you lose contact with that electron flow. Now what happens to us? We live in Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, multi story buildings, skyscrapers. The people who live on the second floor have a 40% higher risk of stroke, especially if they're elderly, than people who sleep on the first floor. That is an amazing little detail fact, Sophia. All, yeah, the all lower, because... Yana. I used to, I live on the third floor of my house, but I ground all the time. I'm grounding right now. I'm connected to the earth. I figured out how to do it in my room, and I can advise people on this as well if they contact me. I don't sell this stuff online because it takes too much hand-holding and explanation. I just can't do this for everyone. So the interested people, if they want to learn about it, I can tell them a little bit. I can tell them what products to get. I have certain of these products that I deal in myself, but it really takes someone who's committed. You can't just write to me and go, tell me about grounding, because I'm not going to do it. You have to research some of it yourself, and then we have to have a conversation, and I can help you understand how to do it. So the I work in my room on basically the third floor, and when I used to go in the afternoon, get in my car, which is obviously not on the third floor, it's on the ground floor mm -hmm. in the garage. I would get in my car and I'd go, oh, thank God. Oh. And I would feel so relieved. And I thought it was because I was leaving the computer behind and the phone and all this stress and people writing me messages and I have to do this, I have to do that. Because I run my Avatar product store, right? Avatarproducts.com. Wow. Wow. This is where I sell the stuff that you like and you've started to use. And I realized later, no, no, no. It's because I'm going down to where the negative charge is. And it immediately makes me feel better. The negative charge is lower to the ground. It's not three stories up. And it's certainly not 20 stories up. That's right. Very important. I, I have actually done a video on my... On my um uh, on on my channel about grounding and I try myself to ground as much as I can and I have done a lot of research on it and it helps anyone who suffers back problems I really recommend to just go out and about 15 minutes a day just lay down on the grass because it's it's uh, you know as you said that the uh, the earth is negatively charged and we are positively charged and this exchange of electrons has a tremendously good effect on our bodies. Also, Yana, we have in our body something called ground substance, literally ground substance. It is a non-fibrous gel that is stored between the tissues. It's an interstitial gel yeah. among the tissues. And when you go outside, let's say you go to the beach and you roam around barefoot and you play in the waves and you jog. And if you look at people on the beach, I've noticed this. Almost everybody who's on the beach, even if they have a nice, big, huge, clean towel or sheet, 
Almost everybody is clutching handfuls of sand while they're l lying flat on the beach sunning mm -hmm. or sleeping or whatever. Or they've got a foot mushed into the sand. Almost no one is off the sand. Instinctively, they know they have to touch the sand because what's happening is they're pulling, they're drawing millions and millions and millions of electrons from the earth, That's whether funny. they're in the water, whether they are on the sand, touching the sand, gardening. You're pulling electrons because you're dabbling around in the soil with your fingers. When we wore leather shoes and we walked with our briefcases on even concrete sidewalks in New York City to work, when school children walked barefoot to school on dirt roads or even wore little leather sandals, they were grounding and their bodies were pulling, pulling, pulling millions and millions and millions of electrons all the time and stalking them, storing them in this ground substance. Then when you went to sleep at night, your body took the electrons from the ground substance and it did its repairs. That was the better source of electrons for ATP. Today, since we are disconnected from the ground, since we have rubber shoes, we don't walk to work on the city sidewalks in leather shoes. We, if, if lawyers, they wear wingtips, they have rubber soles. Everybody's wearing sneakers. We drive in rubber tired cars. We live in sealed flooring houses right right so we are touching the earth people spend years without ever touching the earth and the result is that the body has a default it will take its electrons out of the breakdown of fats and carbohydrates this is known as the krebs cycle oxygen yeah. phosphorylation cellular respiration but yana now that we know this if that's the default, when you're not touching the ground, is it any surprise that junk food, fats and carbohydrates, people are gobbling them up like there's no tomorrow? Right. Yeah, that's right, Sophia. So interesting. Um, you know, just for the sake of time, because we are at the 59 minute mark right now. Can we go to more solutions? Now, one of them is to get out to nature, right? Like, get out as much as you can. Unplug from electronics. Use them only when necessary. Keep going, Sophia. Please give us more solutions. I want you to also talk about your website and some of the products that you added. Right. Um, so I found out by accident that grounding, that magnesium, iodine, and this product restore that you've experienced and Steve and your family, those are the most sensible way to correct your body's redox signaling. Redox signaling is the balance between electron uptake and electron expenditure. When your cells are using up electrons and able to get new electrons and signaling properly between all the various systems, that's called redox balance. When your cells are losing more electrons than they're able to get, that's called redox imbalance. When your redoxing is out of balance, you start getting sick, you start slipping, you start degenerating. So you want to have optimal redox balance. Reduction oxidation, is the, those are the terms that make the truncation redox. And one of the best ways you can do redox balancing is through this product restore. I kid you not. Amazing. Yes. And that is true. I'm speaking from my own experience. I told this on our last show and I still stand for it. We are still using the product. Myself, I started using it. Steve was first, as you no, Sophia, he had very bad ideas. Nobody could help him. Really, he was in desperate condition. Even his work suffered tremendously. But, um, and you know, some products help, like aloe vera. And I put him on a special diet where he ate no gluten. And I still recommend no gluten. But this product, Restore, totally brought him out of these symptoms brought him to a normal condition and he even here and there can even cheat with um with gluten like when we go out to eat he, he just orders pasta you know that is not gluten-free 
and he's doing fine. He does not have any symptoms. I mean, that disease completely disappeared. So anybody suffering from IBS, very painful condition, I definitely recommend this product, but I recommend it, like, Sophia, tell us, it's not only for IBS, it's, uh, it's what else is it good for? We Restore helps your cells to hear each other. It really restores cellular communication. It restores the electrical signaling. This is an ancient language spoken by your gut. Um, I'm going to write a newsletter on gut microbiome, and I hope we can do a show on it as well. But your gut is making a, a huge contribution to the regulation of your health. And one of the things Restore does is it brings these carbon metabolites back into your gut and they speak electrically to the mitochondria in your cells. So what we learned from the Furstenberg book is this, a quote, electricity like rain on a campfire dampens the flames of com combustion in living cells. Living cells need that combustion. They need the ability to fire, to take electrons and fire and do their work. When they don't have enough electrons or oxygen by which they get these electrons, that condition is called hypoxia. And hypoxia creates mitochondrial injury and mitochondrial death. And that contributes to the development of cancer and all kinds of illnesses. So if you can restore cellular respiration and cellular signaling, you get a resurgence of health. And that is one huge thing that Restore does, which is why it's called Restore. And it's not a formula. People have written to me, oh, is it vegan? What's in it? It is a soil extract from ancient soil that contains desert soil, which was never farmed the modern way. And it contains these metabolites of carbon with the right electrical signaling properties. So when you take a teaspoon of Restore before your meals, by the way, the first clinical trial on Restore using humans just came out a couple of months ago, and it showed that within two weeks of use, Restore blocks eliminates 23% of the glyphosate in your system. So it's really good at that because it controls the tight junctions in your digestive system. Well, that makes it a must, a must to take, especially in the United States of America, Sophia, where we have glyphosate in everything. That's right. <laughs> so I know we're running out of time, but I really urge people, if you buy Restore from my website, avatarproducts.com, if you buy the 32-ounce bottle, you get a free pump. You And pumps are really good to have with those big bottles. And you get all kinds of little free samples as well. If you buy an order, if you make an order with multiple products, you're definitely going to get samples of magnesium cream or magnesium gel. Um, if you get iodine, you may get a sample of a different kind of iodine. We try to gift people things so they can keep trying different products, and that p product has a potential to make a big change. I just brought in ionic magnesium, which is an um, oral magnesium that you take as a liquid, and it's a very absorbable, very good. Um, it's not a super commercial product like Calm. People take Calm. Mm -hmm. uh, they take different forms, Epsom salts or magnesium sulfate, Calm is magnesium citrate, and this is a magnesium that has fulvic in it, which is another soil component. So it's really good at um, restoring, again, the um, environment, the cellular environment, very important for the heart. So anyway, I just wanted people to know that that's a new product. And the nerves. Magnesium is very good for the nerves. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, so talk a little bit about iodine. Iodine has an effect on every cell in your body. And it, through a zigzag path, it affects the ATP production in your cells. So it's very important. It is the main component of your thyroid hormones. And your thyroid is one of your body's master regulating glands. So when you make thyroid hormone, that's all the thyroid does. It makes four different kinds of hormone, and they're called T1, T2, T3, T4. And 1, 2, 3, 4, those numbers signify the atoms of iodine in that type of hormone. For instance, T4 is thyroxine. It's used by your brain, and it has four atoms of iodine. T1 has one atom. T3 has three atoms. So get this, Yana. 
Iodine is so close to fluorine, chlorine, and bromine that the poor body, being a bio, biochemical blind man, mistakes bromine, chlorine, and fluorine for iodine. So I now know. it's synthesizing thyroid yeah. hormone out of bromine and fluorine and chlorine. So you're getting fluoridated thyroid hormone, chlorinated thyroid hormone, brominated instead of iodated thyroid hormone which is a huge problem and most people are iodine deficient and when you take iodine it actually detoxifies the toxic bromine out of your body and fluoride that we have in in water it detoxifies those halogens out of your body so it, it is very important right. and then also um if people do their research on iodine and memory and how it's connected to iq i mean my daughter is um dyslexic but i have put her on iodine a little bit you know just um uh, like maybe two drops of lugol solution of two percent a day which has tremendously helped her in her reading and and it's it's a, it does an amazing thing to your brain and memory you, exactly and yeah. we can do a show on that because i did a whole newsletter on iodine and uh, gestation and brain development and it's quite entertaining oh that would be wonderful so, sophia that's something yeah. i'm even more uh, i have more knowledge on that so the show on that would be kind of more lively <laughs> i apologize i'm not that good in electricity as you are i just i was learning here you know so well that's the point i want i was learning when i read arthur's book i was learning the whole time and i had to take these long rests between <laughs> chapters and even pages because i was saying oh my god i didn't even know any of this i know so to just encapsulate where that book takes you Electricity lowers your overall metabolism. It puts you into a semi-hibernation state. Think of it as a very like you're going a little more comatose because your body is trying to cope. So it's going into lower metabolism because it's saying, my God, I got to save energy, right? So electricity, maximum metabolism slows down because of it. Because biology wants to use less energy over time. And the result is you get a longer life. But the quality of your life is worse. So you live longer, but you become and remain sick. Now, when I figured that out from his book, I was thinking, is that not the perfect model for big pharma? That's exactly right. They want you to live longer and they boast about it you know, how big pharma prolongs life and how much longer people live. Well, they forget to say how miserably people live with illnesses, with depression, you know, with a bunch of drugs. I know people who take 40 pills a day, Sophia, 40 medications a day. Because yeah. diabetes, heart disease, this, 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 and then... Um, because of all the side effects, they have to take another 10 pills to uh, against those side effects at first 10 pills cause. You know, it's unbelievable. Uh, the quality of life today is, is very bad. But because we are so consumer oriented, people think the quality of their life is fantastic. And they, you know, they kind of brush aside that they can't sleep and they're constantly stressed. And these are the these are the symptoms of electrical illness. Mm. The stress, people say, oh, it's, I have a fast-paced life. I have a busy schedule. No, it's not from that. Right. Sophia, can you read, like, last paragraph in your newsletter and then talk about this a little bit? Because I thought it was very interesting. So there was this video called 5G Apocalypse, the Extinction Event, and Sasha Stone put it out. And this was around the same time I wrote the newsletter, March, I think. And at the very end, at 1 hour 13 minutes, there was this molecular biologist, Marco Ruggiero. He's an MD, PhD. And I'm going to read the quote from him, which was in that video, 5G Apocalypse. There is light at the end of the tunnel, a ray of hope. Thanks to the principles of biological quantum entanglement, we have learned how to exploit in the field of biology and medicine. Now we can transfer the information from the microbial DNA to the human DNA. 
And in so doing, we can train microbes to withstand whatever extreme condition they're exposed to, including this new technology, 5G, and then train them to transfer this resilience of theirs to our DNA. So this hooks up with what they've done with glyphosate and how they've created the Roundup Ready crops. They have done a gene insertion into the crops, which they learned from a bacteria. A bacteria figured out how to do this all by itself. And that's what they're doing in biology and biotech. They're studying, because you see, bacteria regenerate extremely quickly. They don't need years and years like other life forms. They need a few seconds. They're already multiplying. So they are adapting, adapting, adapting faster than you can blink. And so biology, biotech studies this, and they see how the microbes are adapting to withstand these extreme conditions that they're being exposed to. And then they import that resilience from the microbe into human DNA. So this is called immunoprophylaxis by gene transfer. And what they're doing is they are trying, and this is what Ruggiero is saying, he's saying we will be able down the road to migrate the human species from a susceptible form, which is what we are now, to a resilient form by way of induced genetic changes. So they're going to make us Franken beings. Just technology has migrated us in that it's lengthened our lives, made us nice and sick so we can be billed and charged to the grave. But now it will make us EM, electromagnetic resistant, with these certain DNA improvements that will be grafted right out of these experiments they're doing with these rapidly re reproducing microbes. Wow, they're creating new human species, EMF resistant. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, this is insane. <laughs> They're basically changing us. Uh, probably not our generation, Sophia, but uh, as as you know, our future generations are totally changing Homo sapiens sapiens into something different. I think there is a name for it. Is it uh, Human 2.0? Humanity 2.0, Homo evolutis. That's right, Homo evolutis. That's the name I was looking for. That is insane. Well, here in conclusion, Sophia, because we are at the 115 uh, mark, um, can you please again, in conclusion, tell us your website where they can find information that you are writing and where they can find your products. And uh, that way we will say our goodbyes. Thank you, Yana. My store is avatar, A-V-A-T-A-R, avatarproducts.com. And there are actually brochures and flyers. There's a link that says brochures and flyers, and you can read about magnesium, iodine. You can go to the different tabs like health, sun and skin. You can buy magnesium. It's a fantastic pain reliever. The cream, the gel, the gel is a great deodorant. We also have magnesium spray or brine that works as a deodorant, magnesium roll-on deodorant, lots of different things. And all kinds of iodine. And then the product restore, I would really urge people to try that as well and try it for a couple of months. And then my uh, sophiasmallstorm.com, that's a blog. I'm actually not posting too much. There's tons of stuff on the blog already, but I'm not posting too much right now because I'm deep in these rabbit holes with these newsletters. And I'm really like getting extremely detailed in my study and my attempt to comprehend. And Yana, don't think I'm any kind of you know, wizard myself. I'm just stumbling along learning new things just like everybody. But I've decided I've got to write them down in a newsletter every month so that I don't lose track of it. So it's not just this sea of chaos in my mind, you know? Well, Sophia, you are a researcher and you dedicated your life to this and you have a lot to offer. I recommend that you put all of your newsletters in a book, like a book binding. You know what I mean? Like People probably. say that. I just don't have the time right now. Maybe someday when I'm really old, I'll say, okay, now's the time. I'll make a well, anyway, thank you so much for coming. I hope you listeners enjoyed this information. Thank you, Sophia, for all your research and for your service to humanity. And soon we are going to have another show. I would love to have the one on iodine and 
magnesium and health and because I, I love solutions to these problems, you know, because we talk about all these problems we have and people say, okay, now what? What do we do, right? So we need to offer them some hope, some solutions. Yeah, Jana, I call my website a bioremediation website. If you remediate your biology, even in a simple way, by taking something as inexpensive as iodine or using magnesium or trying Restore, which is a little more expensive, Restore gives you a lot of bang for the buck. And I'm telling you, once you start feeling better, you have more of an ability to, to tackle this, to withstand it, to study it. When you feel bad, when you're depleted, even if it's just what you think of as stress, or anxiety, when you have electrical illness, my gosh, get away from electricity, you know? Oh, yeah. Get, unplug some things, sleep in a room that is as unplugged as possible, and it's going to make a big difference. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for all the information, Sophia. Thank you for listening, and we will have Sophia on in the near future about another very interesting subject. And you guys have good night. And I hope you all had happy 4th of July. Here, can you hear this outside, all this noise? Today is 4th of July. My dog is very scared. So if you heard any kind of noises that wasn't, uh, you know, due to anything happening in my house, it was because outside is... Um, 4th of July. 4th of July. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. And good night, everybody. And talk to you soon.